Force Me Divers. Thank you all for tuning in. I am Nicole, your host for tonight. It is October 20th, 2020. Oh, wait. October 20, 2020. Woo! That's a cool date to have. Uh -huh. All right. So, uh, as you guys know, this is a live broadcast, and we have a great presentation lined up. First of all, I want to know who is there listening in. Give us a hello. Type it out in the comments section. Tell us where you're listening in from. We want to know where you are. Also, if you like this presentation, make sure that you're giving it a thumbs up, heart emoji, or a smiley face to let us know that you are enjoying it. So, uh, Also, one thing that you guys need to do is you need to go over to our website at www.force-e.com and make sure that you go to our event tab and then go scrolling down and you're going to find the presentation for tonight, the Eventbrite uh, URL. Click on there. Make sure that you register because at 7 o'clock we're going to end this registration and we're going to put whoever registered's name into a live raffle and we are going to raffle off a book by the author of Blackwater Night Diving, which is our guest presenter. So you want to make sure that you get in that raffle. So go over to www.force-e.com and go to the event tab and make sure that you register by 4-7. All right. So, guys, uh, if you've never done it before, <laughs> sorry, we're having a meltdown. My child <laughs> Okay. That okay. 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 There you go. All right. <laughs> you gotta love it when the babysitter cancels. <laughs> All right. So, guys, uh, if you've never done a blackwater night dive, it is the newest type of diving that we have here in the South Florida area. We've actually saw that it started, I think, over in Hawaii, but. It's our guests we're going to get a little bit more into it, but um, our boats over here have decided to start getting into it, and there is some really cool, impressive things going on in Blackwater Night Diving, and we have just the right lady here to tell you all about it. So, Linda, say hi to everybody. Hi, everybody. Awesome, and we're going to go ahead and start your presentation, so let me get out of the screen here. Okay. Okay, are we ready? As um, Nicole said, my name is Linda Ionello, and I'm going to talk to you about blackwater diving and a lot about the creatures that are found on these dives in the local area, which is um, for the remote people, it's off the coast of Southeast Florida. So first of all, what is a blackwater dive? Well, black means night dive. So we're out there in the dark, and it's a deep water dive, so there's no reef for reference. The bottom is going to be around six to 700 feet down. So you have to have good buoyancy skills, and you have to be very comfortable diving in this environment where there is no reef and you're just basically in the water column. And here in Florida, it's a drift dive because we're going out close to the Gulf Stream. So when you go in the water, you're drifting north with the current. And finally, think small. Most of the things that we see on these dives are like an inch or less. So you have to be able to look through the particulate and find the little living creatures. So literally, think small, probably an inch or less. So why is this? This is the largest animal migration on Earth that takes place every night in the oceans. The upper level of the ocean, it's the sun, and so there's a lot, a lot of phytoplankton and plankton there, which is food for this, this chain of life that comes up to feed. And they also do this at night to avoid the predators who use their eyesight to find prey. So these little creatures are coming up for food and avoid predation. And some of them are larvae. They're um, larvae of fish that might settle on the reef or other creatures that settle on the reef, or also deep water fish that, again, come up from the depths where there's more food near the surface, and then they go back down again in the morning. 
Other things are what is called holopelagic creatures that spend their whole life in the water column. Every dive is different. We never know what we're gonna see. Um, if we go diving one night and then the next night, you can't predict that it's going to be the same, either the amount of particulate or the variety of creatures, um, the, the phase of the moon, the strength of the current. We, we haven't been able to come up with any kind of a pattern for these dives. So why do we do it? Well, I do it because it's a whole new world. I spend a lot of time diving on the reef and then at Blue Heron Bridge and photographing the, the types of creatures that you find in that environment. But out here, these are things that have never been photographed. When we first started doing these dives, nobody was photographing these. And so it was very interesting to ID these subjects and learn about them and learn about their behavior. And um, over the past years, we have learned a lot about ID, what these are, and um, with a lot of help from scientists. I've done over 280 of the Blackwater dives here in Southeast Florida over the last five years. I've also done a number of Blackwater dives in the Philippines and Indonesia. But everything you'll see in this presentation is from Florida. So the mechanics of the dive. The uh, local boats go out to Palm Beach Inlet, which is where Peanut Island is and the Blue Heron Bridge. So they go out that inlet and go about five miles south to roughly around Breakers Hotel, approximately five miles offshore to where it's 600 to 700 feet deep. So then the divers will jump in the water and as I said, drift with the current northward. On an average, we drift about five miles a night. So ideally you'll come out opposite the inlet and then it's a much quicker run into the inlet and back to the marina. Um, but the run out to the dive location can take about an hour. So the trip back is much shorter. So rule number one, stay with the float ball. It's your dive buddy. Um, photographers are notoriously poor dive buddies. So they have a good excuse here. You don't have to stay with a person. You stay with this ball and line. And the boat deploys this great big buoy with a light underneath it. So it's well lit at the surface. And then a line that's about 45 feet long with lights periodically along it and a light at the bottom pointing up. So these are really bright lights. And honestly, you have no difficulty staying with this. So this whole rig is gonna be traveling about the same speed as the current and the divers and the boat just monitors that buoy and protects it basically. It's like a dive flag, it protects that and the divers. So your responsibility to stay with the float ball and come up near it. Rule number two is stay above approximately 45 feet. But we always say, if you do go to the bottom, bring up some sand to prove it. So the reason for staying above 45 or 50 feet is that deeper than that, the current seems to be slower. So if you're down there for too long, you'll start getting away from the float ball and you'll have to swim harder or struggle to stay with it. And there's no reason to go deeper. A lot of the life is in that upper layer. So this is to me the most challenging underwater photography. There's particulate in the water, which creates backscatter. Uh, there's transparent subjects like jellyfish and fish. So you'll be set up with your strobes to produce a lot of light. And then along comes a reflective fish and you'll overexpose it immediately. Uh, so like I said, it's very challenging. And this is pretty much a worst case scenario. This is a very small subject with a lot of particulate in the water and the strobes are not aimed properly so that they're reflecting all that particulate back into the lens. So for photographers, the first dive is kind of spent figuring this out. For any particular photo setup or camera and strobe setup, you have to figure out what is gonna work best for you. And like I said, the first dive is, is a learning curve, definitely. So we'll start getting into some of the subjects that we see, starting with the fishes. This is the kind of iconic fish that we first started to really recognize on these dives, and it's a spotfin flounder larva. And as I mentioned, um, 
transparent fish. This is one of them. And it has these gorgeous appendages. So it's very uh, identifiable when you see it. And if you know anything about flounder larvae, they start out with the eyes on both sides of the head. So you can see this guy has an eye on the side nearest us and the other eyes on the other side. And that eye is gonna migrate around as it gets older and getting ready to settle to the bottom. And in the lower corner is a picture of a spotfin flounder adult at Blue Heron Bridge. And you can see why it's called spotfin. And you can kind of see in the very lower corner that both eyes are on the top of the head because he's a flat fish that lives on the bottom. So this is another flounder. It doesn't have the appendages. This is called an eyed flounder. And you can see in this one, the eye, the second eye has already migrated around to the top. And in the lower corner is what it looks like on the bottom. But in the upper right, that's an example of what these guys do when we focus our lights on them. Uh, remember, they're coming up in the dark. They're looking for food. They want to want protection. And we start shining our lights on them. And they either book for the surface or book for the bottom or start spinning in circles. So that's another reason this uh, photography is so difficult. These subjects are not on a reef or in the muck, just sitting there waiting for you to come along and take their picture. They, um, they quite often start moving around quite rapidly. So another reason it's challenging. So you think, okay, I got the flounders. They're transparent, they have these appendages, but this is not a flounder, it's a toadfish, which is another flat fish that lives on the bottom that's not quite so common. And uh, again, in the upper right, you can see this is one from Blue Heron Bridge. They're a little narrower than the flounders. And the larvae have these big guts hanging out. So that's one way to tell the tongue fish from the flounders is that protruding gut. Then here's the favorite lionfish. Um, I have to say that the larvae are adorable. Um, they, they hang in the water column with their fins flared like that, and so do the soapfish. The soapfish are much prettier as larvae than as adults. You can see it has these pretty fins, and it has that long um, filament coming up in the top. And both of these will kind of hang in the water column with their fins flared just hanging until you come along with your lights, and then they'll start to pull in their fins and look for the bottom. So this is another one that does that behavior. It's called a tripod fish. This is a larvae of a deep water fish that will eventually settle on the bottom at the 600 or 700 feet. And it hangs with the fins flared, but you can see as an adult, it sits on the bottom and why it's called a tripod is it has those two fins extended in the front and it uses its tail to balance itself and it, it sits a little bit above the ocean bottom because there's a little more current there. So it will sit and wait for the current to bring it some food. So the reason that scientists think these guys are hanging with their fins flared is mimicry to make them look like jellyfish, which don't taste very good to, the predator, to most of the predators. So this is interesting because before we started doing all this photography of these animals in their natural environment, the scientists were pulling them up in nets at the back of a boat. And by the time they got them on the boat, you know, they look nothing like they do in the water. They're mangled, they're torn, they're shredded, etc. So once the fish scientists at the Smithsonian started seeing these images of these fish hanging in the water column, they started to realize that they, what they're doing is they are mimicking the jellyfish and it's all as a way to um, avoid predators. So here's another uh, section of fish that, that we call fish in a bubble. And they're still cute. This is a pancake bat fish. And it literally starts out in this bubble. And then you can see in the lower right-hand side what the adult looks like. Again, this is a shot from Blue Heron Bridge. So these are really cute little fish. And then the deep water angler fish are also starting out in a bubble. And these ones are, again, these are fish that will settle in the deep water, not on a reef or not on the bottom. And um, 
The one on the left, I think, is just gorgeous with those colors. And the one on the right, it took us a long time working with the science, several a couple of scientists to um, figure out what it was going to grow up to be. And they do things like counting the thin rays and um, trying to figure out basically what it's going to look like when it grows up. Nobody had photographed that one before as a larva. So this is another angler fish, uh, a football fish. And it's interesting that this one they know is a female. The angler fish have this um, very interesting life pattern where the males are tiny, much smaller than the females. And they generally become parasites on the female. So they literally, their organs will die off and they just become a parasitic sperm donor. So the females are the ones that have the lures because they're the ones that are doing the hunting and the fishing. And this one is just starting to develop a lure so the scientists could figure out that this is a female. And deep water angler fish are some of the ugliest fish. They, if you look at Google pictures of them, they have huge, usually they have huge fangs and they have this funny looking lure and everything. So this is what this particular one will look like as an adult. But then there's the frogfish, which looks a lot like the deep water angler fish, but this frogfish is going to eventually settle on a reef or a shallow substrate. Um, and the reason that they started to figure this one out is because it has the little pelvic fins developing at the bottom, which are used to crawl along the bottom, as opposed to the living in the water column, the deep water ones. So this was interesting. This is the uh, only frogfish larvae that I have ever found. We frequently see a variety of jacks in the water column. Um, quite often, they are hiding in something. The one in the upper left obviously is in sargasm. The one in the, the other side is hiding in a jellyfish, which is common behavior for jacks in the Pacific. They will uh, swim around hanging onto a jellyfish or with their nose buried in a jellyfish. But we don't see this behavior as much here. And then the lower one is trying to hide under a tube anemone larvae. And the squirrel fish, we see these on the, the reefs a lot, but the larvae uh, have this long nose and the, the spiky fins that will get shorter as they get older. So the one on the top is very young with a great big long nose. The one on the lower right is getting a little older and the nose is starting to shorten and then the spikes are going away. And then of course, the uh, way it settles eventually as an adult, it has no spike on its nose at all. We see a fair number of larval eels and they're very challenging to photograph because they're very transparent and they're always moving fast. Um, the, occasionally though, they will get this defensive behavior where it curls up with the head in the center and we figure that's to protect the head, which is obviously the most important part. So when they do this curling up, it's a little easier to photograph them because they will kind of stop and, and hover a little bit. And we don't have any uh, species IDs on these eels, except for the one at the bottom, which has that unique scallop pattern. And that has been proven to be a snake eel larva. So we're talking eels. There's these things called cusk eels. And these are two varieties of cusk eels. And you can see kind of like the tongue fish, the one on the bottom has that protruding gut. Um, but they aren't truly eels, they are fish. And the picture in the bottom shows what they will look like as an adult, which is plain, ugly fish. There's a real variety of species of cusk eels. And so therefore, there's a variety of larvae. And you can see this one that almost looks like a flounder, you know, flounder or tonguefish. You know, so it gets a little confusing as to what's what. And there's no real reference books. When we started this, there was no books to use. So we really relied heavily on um, uh, the Blackwater Photos Facebook page and the scientists that monitor that group and tell us what things are. It's just been a tremendous help. So here again is mimicry that 
image on the left is a cusp seal larva, and it's a very rare one. I, I've only seen it once, but you can see that it's mimicking a siphonophore, and the siphonophore stings really bad. So, um, in fact, they sting worse than jellyfish. So the cusp seal is mimicking the siphonophore to try to keep predators from eating it. This guy's cute. This bony-eared ass fish. This that and that's his common name, and it is in the cusp seal family. But gorgeous. You can see those gorgeous fins and filaments and everything. And the interesting thing about this one is that this fish has the smallest brain to body ratio of any fish. So I figure it gave up some brain for looks. We do see game fish sometimes, um, the swordfish and the sailfish, um, quite small, about an inch, inch and a half, and they, but they already have these teeth and, and their bills. And if you're lucky, you can catch a sailfish with its sail up. We were just starting to see some of these recently near the surface where they seem to be coming into the lights around the ball to feed. So it's interesting trying to um, catch it, like I said, with the sail up. And then there's dolphin fish or mahi-mahi. Um, we do see these quite often. The larvae in the upper image is more frequently seen. And then the, the juvenile in the lower image with all the colors already and everything was hanging up around some sargasm on the surface. And we see seahorses quite often, um, usually hanging on to something like the one on the right. This guy's hanging on to some sargasm and just drifting along, but we also see them free swimming. And you really wonder what the seahorses are doing out there, and I hope they make it to the reef eventually. And I know these are lime seahorses, and also everyone I've photographed, because again, you count the fin rays and that little fin on its back. And that's the, the best way to ID the seahorses because you can't really go by shape or appendages or bumps at this stage. So all the ones I've seen have been lying seahorses. And if it's really, really, really calm out there, which is not very often, there's flying fish on the surface quite often, especially if there's sargasm around. And if it's really calm, you try to shoot the flying fish and get the reflection. So this is one night when um, everything worked right and I got this perfect reflection of a flying fish at the surface. But it's really hard if it's not calm. If there's any kind of wave action, it is so hard to get your camera stable and get shots at the surface. So now I'm gonna to switch to gelatinous zooplankton. And that's jellyfish, salts, and siphonophores. And the message here is that the little jellyfish can just be so gorgeous. And they look at the colors in detail. And this one on the right. And here's a couple more. Now, the bells on these is probably smaller than your thumbnail in most cases. But they have such gorgeous colors and detail. And these two, look at the pink, and the one on the right. And the one on the left has a little amphipod on it, which happens frequently. You see amphipods riding on a variety of things. Here's another one. This is another example of not liking the lights. This jellyfish would have been all strung out with the tentacles flared, and you start shining your light on it and it starts to curl up the tentacles and um, withdraw, close up. Just a couple more varieties of colors and, and shapes. And then comb jellies, which you've probably seen. You can see these during the day. They, they can be fairly large, like softball size. And they have these cilia, and they reflect such gorgeous colors. So these seem to be kind of seasonal when we get the big ones. And I've seen them just diving last week. There was quite a few out there. But they have such pretty colors when you get the light reflecting off of them. And here's a couple of smaller comb jellies. These ones are quite small and the gorgeous colors that you can get. We do have box jellyfish. I have photographed at least two species. Um, this one is quite small. Again, the bell is probably the size of your thumbnail or smaller. Um, it will sting, but it's nowhere near as bad as the ones like in Australia, etc. So they sting, but 
<laughs> not as bad as the um, man of war. So the box jellyfish, you want to stay away from them, but don't panic if you see one. And this one's very pretty. This is a pink moony juvenile. Occasionally we get the pink moonies, the, the full-size jellies, apparently feed on the moon jellies. So when we get a lot of moon jellies around, you might see a pink moony mixed in. Um, this one's a juvenile, and I just love the, the ruffles and the delicate nature of it. And these are scalps. Scalps have a very um, interesting life cycle, and they can go from singles to chains to clusters. And the singles at a certain time, like about a month ago, every one of them had a little jack riding in it, like this one. Um, now we're seeing some singles with no fish in them. So things are seasonal, but it's hard to know why or what. And siphonophores, I mentioned siphonophores with the um, cuscule mimicry. And the one on the bottom is kind of flared out, but when when you first come across it, all those tentacles are just all strung out. And this is when you have to be careful not to swim right into it to pay attention because like I said, these, these guys sting and especially they seem to find uh, the place right above the irregulator where you're exposed. But when you shine your lights on them, they withdraw their tentacles totally like the one in the upper corner and swim off. You know, they don't like the light. So changing to crustaceans. On a night dive on the reef, you know in your lights you get a lot of worms. Well, on the blackwater dives, we get a lot of amphipods that are attracted to the lights. They dart around and spin around, and sometimes they're, they're quite dense, like the worms on the reef. Some nights are worse than others. And when they're moving so fast, they bump into everything, including your subject. So they can be a hassle because your subject is flying off. And we've also learned to wear a hood. Otherwise, you can come up from the dive with a whole bunch of these things in your hair and possibly even in your ears. But they can be beautiful. If you can get them to stay still long enough and get a shot. They have these gorgeous big eyes, those big orange parts of the whole eye. And they have such pretty colors and features. But it's very hard to get them to sit still. So Fronima, this is a specialized amphipod. And again, these are pelagic. They live their whole lives in the water column. And this one is called a monster in a barrel. And it's also believed that it is the uh, prototype for the alien in the alien movie. And what this female does is she attacks the cell and hollows it out and then it raises and feeds her young inside the cell. So here's a couple of images of free swimming ones. You can see they look like the alien. And the one on the right, those claws for hollowing out the cell. And then here's a mother with the babies inside a cell. And this is typical behavior where the babies are all in a circle around the edge and the mother is in the middle and she'll stick her tail end outside the cell and propel it through the water. And I assume that that is to get nutrients to feed the babies. So crabs, crabs have a, a zoe larvae stage. Um, they have these, a lot of them have these appendages, which presumably make them harder to eat. Although I have seen one in uh, inside a comb jelly, but they have these uh, appendages and nobody, we don't have a scientist who's doing any work on these larvae, so we don't know what species any of these are, but they are very colorful, as you can see, there's colors and shapes going on here. And we call these stickheads. Susan Mears originally coined this term, and it is stuck, so we call them stickheads because of those uh, spikes. And again, the one on the, the left has a little bit shorter spikes. And then the next stage of their growth is the megalopha stage. And quite often you see them like the one in the upper corner that's uh, strung out, you can see his legs and he, he's swimming along, but you start to shine your light on them and they pull in their legs like the lower one and just become this little P-shaped thing. So it's hard to get. I always want pictures of them showing their legs and everything, it's very difficult. They don't cooperate. 
This is a spiny lobster larva. And these guys like to hang on to cyclonophores. I, they're using them for um, defense, and I've heard that they may also prey on them. But this one, as you can see, he has four siphonophores attached to four of his legs. And so you see this swimming along, and I saw one recently where the siphonophore had to be six or eight inches trailing along behind it. And the colors even kind of match the lobster. This is a slipper lobster larva, and he has a different. Uh, strategy. He rides on single jellyfish. And so this is one way to kind of tell the difference between the two. And it, it's not 100%, but it seems to be the two styles of behavior between the two larvae. So shrimp. Again, there's nobody working on the shrimp larvae to tell us what they grow up to be or to give us IDs. So I don't even know if a lot of these are larvae of shrimp that are going to settle either on the reef or on the, the deep water, or if they're pelagic, some of these shrimp will live their whole life again in the water column. So I'm just going to show you some pretty pictures of shrimp. And like I said, I don't know what these things grow up to be, but they have such interesting colors. And look at the tail in this guy. And this one I call crinoid legs for the obvious reason. Um, you see this one fairly frequently. And, you know, why does he have such elaborate legs? Maybe filtering food? I don't know. Just another pretty shrimp. These ones are very dark when you see them. It takes a lot of light to bring out these colors. And then when you bring out the colors with a lot of light, you start to bring up all the particulates. So these ones are difficult to shoot. This is an interesting shrimp larvae. The scientists originally we're seeing these in the stomachs of fish. And they thought that they were a unique species. So they named them and called them a particular species of shrimp. Then they found out just within the last 10 years that they were larvae of a deep water shrimp. So they had to change their whole naming on these. And I think these are so interesting because of all the bumps and texture on them. And we don't see these that often, but they, to me, they're gorgeous. You see a lot of this particular shrimp with the sparkly legs riding on things. He always seems to be riding on something, some kind of gelatinous zooplankton. And in this case, it's a jellyfish, and you can see the little jack that is going for the ride also using the jellyfish for protection. So we're going to switch to mollusks, which is one of my favorite categories, and sea butterflies. These are mollusks, like I said, but they're pelagic. They live their whole lives in the water column. And this one, the, the body is smaller than your fingernail. And they have developed those wings, the, those two flaps, which is why they're called sea butterflies. And that's how they get around. And usually you see them just kind of hanging in the water column. And this is the most common one that we see. Here's a couple more species of sea butterflies. And all the sea butterflies have this shell. So each one will have some kind of a shell. And the interesting thing is that the scientists identified them by their dead shell. So when I came along with images of live animals, it was a little difficult getting actual species identifications. And even now, I'm not, these ones are obvious. I mean, these are an obvious shape, but some of them are still a little iffy. And this one here is interesting because the right-hand image is a younger version of the left image. And the, that pointy part on the bottom apparently gets broken off as it gets older. So these are the same species, different stages. This is my favorite. This one, um, this is a sea butterfly, lives in the water column, but it has developed these appendages that look just like leaves. So we've been talking about mimicry as a way of uh, defense. So why would this guy think that leaves would be helping in his defense? And how would it ever see anything like leaves out in the water column. 
So this is, you know, obviously there's a reason they they don't do this, expend this energy for no reason. But it sure would be nice to know what. And this is another sea butterfly that's very um, noticeable when you see it. It has these beautiful golden speckles on it. So you always know when you see one of these. And these are fairly common. So sea butterflies feed by putting out a mucus web. They hang in the water column with this web of mucus that just traps things and then they'll pull it in and feed on it. And this is a sea butterfly being preyed on by a tube anemone. Sea butterflies are at the bottom of the food chain. A lot of things like to prey on them. So this is a tube, tube anemone with a sea butterfly. And this is an Atlanta which is a sea elephant, which is a different category, preying on that sea butterfly. And it almost looks like it's drinking out of a champagne glass. So since they live their lives in the water column, you can occasionally find them mating. They, they usually kind of hang uh, until you shine the lights on them. And you can catch them mating and spawning. You know, again, they're laying eggs. Um, these are two different species, and you can see that they have two different egg strings. The one on the left is like a string of pearls, and the one on the right is like a, a zigzag thing. Um, so when you see, and they release the eggs. So sometimes when you see the eggs in the water column, you can figure out who's, who they belong to, where they came from. So these sea butterflies with their shells, are a major part of the food chain, as I mentioned, but they're becoming ocean canaries because the elevated CO2 is causing ocean acidification. And that excess acid in the water is, is eating away at their shells. The shells are becoming very fragile. Uh, I read that um, in the last 10 years, the shells have become 30% thinner. So if these guys can't adapt to this increased acidification, it's going to cause problems with the whole food chain because they're at the bottom. And there are whales that migrate up to the Arctic to feed on these where they're very, very dense. So all this elevated CO2 and ocean acidification has ramifications that you don't even think about. So now I'm gonna to switch to gymnosomes. These lose their shells within a few days of hatching. So they don't have, as adults, they don't have shells. And again, these guys live in the water column uh, their whole life cycle. They have these little wings like the sea butterflies and they flap them like mad. These guys are always moving. They're very fast moving through the water column. They're called sea angels and their favorite food is sea butterflies. So that's why they're swimming like mad. They're looking for the sea butterflies. So this is the most common one we see, the angel, and you can see its wings just behind the head, fairly large. Here are two more varieties. One has very big long horns and the other one has a long tail, but they, again, they have varying sizes of wings. And since they live in the water column, occasionally you can catch them mating. Uh, it's not very common to find these guys mating and spawning. So we do see this fairly often when they're around. Um, they'll, this is the one time they sit still. They'll hang in the water column and flap their little wings like that and produce this egg mass, which is held together by mucus. And when they're done, they just swim away and leave the eggs to fend for themselves. And as I mentioned, they like to feed on sea butterflies. So here's a sea angel preying on a sea butterfly, which looks as big as itself, but it's trying to get the animal out from inside that shell. So villagers, villagers are gastropod larvae, which are the mollusks that crawl around on the bottom. Well, these are their larvae and they have a foot shell a perculum, which is the thing that closes the shell, that closes the door, just like the adults. They have lobes with cilia on them. And these lobes are used for swimming and then the little cilia collect the food particles. 
So the most common ones we see have these four lobes, which are either curled up or mostly straight out, and then the little shell in the center part. They do have eyes, so it's a challenge to photograph them with the eyes. You can see the eyes at the base of the, the little tentacles. And they seem to have learned to turn their back in the light. So when you shine your light on them, they uh, seem to turn their back and they're so small. This guy is probably the animal the size of your little fingernail. So it's quite difficult to tell even if you're shooting the front or the back. And then to try to get the eyes when he's turning his back is even more challenging. And they don't like the light even more. If you shine your light on them too long, they'll pull in their lobes, close the operculum and sink to the bottom. Some of them have these two large lobes, which are very pretty. They reflect the colors from the strobe and they're just gorgeous. And like, like everything else, um, we don't have anybody, scientists that are working on these larvae to know what they're gonna grow up to be. So um, we have a variety, but I don't know what species any of them are. And this is adorable. This is, I call sparkles. Very small. This whole animal is less than half an inch and it has these gorgeous colors. And again, why? But it had, they just, the reds and the greens just glow and the shell in the center is very small. And here you can see the little eyes even. So I mentioned that I spent a lot of time on Blue Heron Bridge photographing nudibranch. And I was thrilled to learn that there was a pelagic nudibranch. Um, there's two species. This is one of them. Uh, it does not like the light. So as soon as you start focusing on it, it books through the bottom, pulls in the rhinophores. The one on the left, the rhinophores are tight into the body and heads for the bottom. Again, they're pelagic. They live their lives in the water column. So the one on the right is spawning. You can see the little string of eggs coming out of it. I have never seen these guys mating, so. so they do it somewhere, but never seen it. And this is the other kind of pelagic nudibranch, and this one feeds on siphonophores. So the ones on the left are hooked onto the siphonophore tentacle, and apparently they will just keep eating until the siphonophore is gone, and then go find another. And occasionally you see these free swimming. So the one on the right is a free swimming of the same species. Mollusks, squid or mollusks. So we do see squid. The one on the right is tiny. Uh, we see a lot of very small larvae, um, less than half an inch, just starting to get his colors. And I think the, the one on the left is cute. It seems like he's trying to pull his tentacles over his eyes and tell me to go away and leave him alone. So we see varying um, Sizes of squid, it seems like around November, December, we start seeing bigger ones that come in to try to feed in the lights. But um, prior to that, we start seeing these little tiny larvae. This is called the sharpier enope squid. This is a deep water squid. And again, we see the, the smaller larvae or juveniles up near the surface to feed. And this is the classic pose where his tentacles are all spread out perfectly. And uh, so you try to shoot this guy from the top down and get that pose with the tentacles. And this is a diamond squid. And these guys have the most gorgeous colors in their tentacles. And this one, I always seem to find the ones that are pea size. So this one has, has the gorgeous colors, but if you've noticed in some of the contests lately, um, there's an image of a Pacific one that has been winning contests. It has a lot of gold. The tentacles are spread out. You can see the gold uh, webbing between them and everything. And that's a much larger, more developed one of these. And again, it's from the Pacific. Did you see larval octopus? This little guy is probably pea size, but he's already developed the chromatophores and getting the coloring and everything. Um, we seem to see the tiny ones and nothing much bigger. Except for this one, which is a paper nautilus. This specific nautilus lives in the water column and 
the females build this shell. This, it's a shell that protects their eggs. And they also have a specialized tentacle which can cover this shell. So these are very, well, they were very rare. For several years, we never saw any. And the Pacific, Anilau, they were finding, they find them every spring, like February, March, April. And you can almost guarantee you see them on every dot. Around the same time frame in the last couple of years, we started seeing them, but one or two, definitely not every dive. But they are becoming a little more common. So these, both these images are the female with the shell. And this is a little baby. It could be the female, it could be the male. We don't know. At this stage, at this size, we can't tell. But the interesting thing about these guys is that they hide in the cell chains. So in the corner, you can see each individual cell in the chain has an orange organ. So the little octopus gets in the chain and looks like part of the cell. So you have to really focus on the chain and look for an extra orange spot. And again, very small, pea size at least. But it, it's interesting and challenging to try to find these little octopus. So this is my camera setup. This is what I use to shoot these um, tiny subjects. It's the Nikon D500. Um, the D500 in the Nikon line is one of the fastest focusing. So it's good for the black water dives. One of the issues with things like some of the point and shoot cameras, et cetera, is they just can't focus fast enough to focus on all these little animals that are darting all over and not sitting still. I use a third strobe to give me extra light for uh, these transparent subjects. Two focus lights so that they, they're aimed in towards the port. So they give the camera light to focus. And they, I also use them for hunting, for finding subjects. The 60 millimeter lens, we found that the 60 works much better than the 105 or the 100. Um, you're closer to your subject, the 100 or the 105 seeks and uh, tries to focus on the particulate in the water. If you're using a magnifying viewfinder, uh, the straight through seems to be easier because you can track your subject better. If you're using the 45 degree viewfinder, it's more difficult. Although some people who are totally used to that viewfinder do fine. But for uh, beginners, it's much better to have a straight through viewfinder. Uh, no diopter. Uh, the diopters would magnify the subjects, but the depth of field is so shallow, it's extremely difficult, again, to track the subjects and to uh, lock in on it. And finally, a lanyard or some way to attach the camera to yourself because you don't want to drop it when the bottom is at 700 feet. I use a lanyard around my wrist. Other people use clips onto their BC, et cetera. So what do you do with all these images? Um, Susan Beers and myself put together this uh, guide to Florida blackwater diving called Blackwater Creatures. Um, it's available at all three 4C locations or at blackwatercreatures.com. And it's um, pictures, but it's also information. It's, it's not a coffee table book. It's information about the subjects because and IDs as much as, as we have. Um, but a lot of people were coming on the boats after the dives and saying, I saw all this stuff, but I don't know what it was. So this is really trying to help people enjoy their dives more and, and understand what they're seeing and learn about them. And as an aside, Nicole is raffling off one of those books uh, when I'm done. And if you want to see a lot more images, uh, Susan's website is nearestphoto.com and mine is lindaiphotography.com. So you can go to our website and the uh, Blackwater Creature Galleries are roughly the same categories as I had in the presentation. You can see uh, on mine, you can see every species that I've uh, photographed with the, uh, like I said, the ID to the best of my ability. And this fish is a dragonfish, larval dragonfish with a great big long gut hanging off the image. And if you want to do a blackwater dive uh, locally here in Florida, um, you can sign up with 4C. The boat they use does them on Sunday, Wednesday, and Friday. One note though, that we're coming into the winter 
and the um, wind and waves can be rough. We're going five miles offshore, so it's much rougher out there than it is close to shore on the reefs. So you have to be aware that dives are getting canceled. And, and this, through the next three or four months, it starts to stabilize again around March, April. But um, they're fantastic dives. So hopefully I will see you on one in the future. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome. Um, we have lots of questions coming in. <laughs> and uh, fire some off here. Um, first off, uh, going back to like how to do the dives. Okay, so we got the cool diagram of you know you spend with the line. So I mean, do you really stay in the buddy team so that like one person can be like, oh, there it is, and the other person can like shoot the photos, or is it kind of like you got to find it yourself and shoot it yourself? Yeah, it's. It's very difficult to stay in buddy teams in this environment. Um, so pretty much everybody goes off on their own, but you can see that line from quite a ways away. So even when I stop and photograph something and kind of lag behind, I just look up and I can see the line ahead of me. So it's, it's a lot easier than it sounds. So no, you don't have a spotter. <laughs> <laughs> um, awesome. And then another thing about cameras, everyone was very impressed with your camera setup and they wanted to know like how much would that cost? And mm. uh, you know, it's, it's kind of one of those things that you start just, you yeah, start with basics and then you start adding on and then you take off and you get something else. And so I know over time that, you know, eventually it builds up, but um, have you ever seen people, I, you, you did mention the point shoots are a little too slow to capture the photos, um, but using like GoPros or any other like smaller cameras, can they use those on these types of dives? Yeah, people, I've seen people with GoPros and the big thing is that you need the light. So you, you need enough light for the camera to focus and to light up your subject. Um, so people have used GoPros. Um, some people are using mirrorless cameras. They, the, the, more newer mirrorless cameras will work fine. Um, the big thing is that you can't bring out just a little point and shoot and really get anything unless you're lucky enough to be out on a night where there's big squid or big jellyfish or something. But uh, the smaller cameras are very challenging. Yeah. And frustrating. Uh <laughs> uh, and then, you know, obviously uh, there's a little bit of post-production. So um, <laughs> what a how much time do you spend on post-production? How much of what we're seeing in these photos is like, you know, oh, does it come out with a nice black background or are you doing a lot of, you know, editing? Okay, um, one thing, I use the third strobe so I can shoot up at F32, which gives me a pretty black background. I don't have to do too much with the background, but depending upon how much particulate is in the water in a given night, uh, I may, I probably have to do some backscatter removal. I use Lightroom, so I'm not doing a lot of post-production. I don't go into Photoshop and do a lot of manipulation. I try to keep it to a minimum, but I do some adjustments in Lightroom, um, maybe fine-tuning the black a little bit, taking out some backscatter, and uh, a bit of sharpening, you know, but try not to do too much. Awesome. And then since we're still talking about the photo aspect, uh, you've entered a lot of photo competitions. How much has your Blackwater Night Dives uh, won, you hmm. know, prizes versus like people shooting day sh shots? Yeah, I don't, I don't enter contests. Oh. Um, you know, I, I'm into the scientific, take a picture, idea, learn about it. Um, cool. There's a couple of people in our group who enter contests. And I would say a couple of years ago when the Blackwater was newer, they were doing pretty well. Um, now there's a guy from China who, who practically lives in Annalau and he goes out with his own boat and two or three guides and he's getting just unbelievable images and he is winning contests. It's very hard to compete with him. But um, I, it's kind of like it goes through a phase. And like I said, about two years ago, it was all new and people were winning. And now it's kind of getting a little bit, the judges and say, oh, we've seen that before. So if you're going to enter Blackwater images now, it has to be something that's, that's quite unique and that's just an absolutely awesome shot. 
Okay. Now everyone wants to know, is there like one particular photo that you're like, that's my money shot. That was the coolest thing I've ever seen. Um, do you have maybe multiple of those or just one in particular? To me, it's more the, the subject. Um, I, I really like that, that sea butterfly with the leaves. It's like, why did it do that? And lately I'm really enjoying the um, anglerfish larvae because we hadn't seen those. We, I was just starting to find them. And they're so fascinating being in the little bubble and it's like they grow up to such an ugly fish, but um, they're more unusual. So I kind of like those at the moment. And some people are asking, you know, what if I just don't have the investment or maybe the skill level to get the photos? Is it worth going out and doing these dives or is it only really for photographers? Mm -hmm. Um, as I mentioned, you have to be able to look for the little stuff. So right off the bat, if, if you're going as a non-photographer, you ha still have to be interested in things that are an inch or smaller. Otherwise, you're not going to enjoy it at all and you're not going to see much. So if you're the type of person who likes to look at the little stuff, um, there are people that come on the boats that, that are not photographers and some of them enjoy it. Honestly, some of them say, this is not for me either because of the environment, they're not comfortable, or they just can't look through the particulate and find the subjects. And again, that's another reason for the book is so that people can look at the book. Um, there's one on the boat. And so we hope that people will look at the boat book and be a little bit prepared. So when they see something in the water, they know what it is and they know, oh, there's the head or there's the eyes or whatever. So it, I think, if somebody is interested in, in learning and seeing new things, it, it would be good. But you have to go with the right frame of mind. Excellent. And uh, just one more thing about photography. Uh, they're wondering, do you have a certain ISO f-stop shutter speed that you start with and then you start to fine tune from there? Yeah. Um, again, the reason for the three strobes is that I try to start at f32 which gives me the black background and it gives me the depth of field so that when I have a very, very small subject, like these, these subjects that are half an inch or quarter of an inch, I'm doing tremendous cropping. So you want as much depth of field and detail as you can. So I started F32, ISO is 200 and shutter speed is 1 250th. And then my three strobes are about three quarter power. For people with two strobes, they're usually three quarter to full power and down around F16, F18 to get enough light. Awesome, okay, a couple more questions and then we're done. Uh, they wanna know, um, is there, uh, I know that you do these, you try and do these uh, dives year round, but is there a particular time of year that you're like, oh no, this is the right time to go? Yeah, we're see we seem to see more larval fish in the spring. So once we get through the rough seas, like uh, April, May, June, July are good. Uh, you're between the winter seas and hurricane season. So for anybody who's coming here from out of town, it's best to come in the time frame when you know you're going to be pretty reliably getting out. Uh, yes, I do them year round, but I live here. So if a dive gets canceled or three or four dives get canceled, it's not a big deal to me. You know, I pick and choose when it's calm enough. But um, Definitely, if you're coming from out of town, come in the in the good seas so that you pretty reliably will get out, which is April through August or so. Awesome. Okay, and one more question. They know that you're talking about little things. <laughs> Any big things that you see while you're on these dives? Everybody wants to know if we see sharks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, the first two or three years, never saw a shark then it for some reason um november december we seen a bigger squid coming in to feed around the ball and maybe it's related we started getting silky sharks and i think they're probably coming in to feed on the squid um the first year or so they were maybe two foot sharks and they were quite curious, quite in our face. And at first we didn't know what kind of shark they were and we were a little wondering. Then we figured out they were silkies and they weren't really, uh, they're, they're not an issue, they're just in your face. 
And last year, we started getting some bigger silkies. So I, I talked to a fisherman who said the silkies are migrating from the colder water up north to the warmer water to the south at that time of year. So maybe that's why we're seeing the silkies. Um, they've never been a problem, never been an issue, but um, they're there and probably more than we know. And the only other thing we've seen is um, a couple of times we've seen uh, adult sailfish or swordfish. And, and in fact, it's interesting, just last week, somebody, two people saw barracuda, a full-size barracuda out in the middle of the water column. So who knows what it was doing out there, but none of these things are, are a risk or a problem. And they're very rare, very rare. Yeah. It'd be kind of cool to have like a pot of dolphins like come through one of these days, but <laughs> somebody saw them on the surface and oh. heard them underwater, but we didn't see them. Yeah, yeah, yeah that would be very I won't be set up to take photos of them. So <laughs> no, that's the problem. We're set up for tiny stuff and something big goes by. It's like, okay. <laughs> I'm waiting for the whale shark. And then I'll be sitting there like, huh. And then he always says, oh, you need a picture to prove it. And you're like, what? Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, here's an eye shot. <laughs> uh, it's like spot. I don't know. <laughs> right. Right. Um, okay, awesome. Well, uh, I also wanted to mention, I mean, just watching uh, some of these photos that you had in the presentation tonight, I mean, people were commenting, like, how beautiful the photos, how beautiful the animals were. And, and uh, you know, I, I just kind of looked at them like, this is perfect. It like leads us right into Halloween. I mean, literally there's so many cool little animals that you could dress up as, and we could like have a blackwater, you know, Halloween costume contest or something. So it's funny that I say that because I'm going to go ahead and pull up here. Uh, so, so 4C, hold on. I'm uh, trying to get this up here. So 4C has our, in our events, we have actually um, two Halloween dives coming up. Uh, we have one at the Blue Heron Bridge. It's during our night dive. It is on the 29th. And we also have our zombie apocalypse diver course, which uh, you get to dress up as zombies and go diving. So it's a lot of fun. And uh, we hope to see some of you guys there. And here's some inspirations. You can dress up as some of the uh, little animals that you saw during the presentation. And uh, you can win some prizes because uh, we're going to be doing a, a costume contest during that uh, Blue Heron Bridge night dive. So get some inspiration from this uh, presentation. So, all I've right, seen, go ahead. I've seen jellyfish costumes. Ah, yeah. there you go. <laughs> <laughs> you can put like little like, you know, Christmas lights in there to like light yourself. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, okay, and so um, again, that's the event page guys that we were talking about. And this month we also have wetsuits on sale. And uh, Linda, you talked about wearing a hood, wearing wetsuits when you're doing these dives because it is in the nighttime. It does get cold and uh, especially as we get here into the winter months. So make sure you're coming to Forcey to get that wetsuit. And there is the Blackwater Creatures book that you were talking about. Uh, authors are Linda Ilanello and Susan Mears. Uh, Linda, is there any talks about doing a second one? Uh, we're thinking about it because I'm trying to focus on some behavior, some more behavior than we originally had in the book. So we're starting to think about, um, yeah, a second edition with some of the new stuff. I mean, obviously it's about two years old and I'm out there shooting a lot. So I do have some new stuff. So maybe yeah. within the next year. <laughs> awesome. So that brings us to the raffle. You're, we're gonna raffle off one of your books um, and I'm gonna go ahead and just hang out there. I'm going to close you so that I can get to the raffle here. Okay, everybody. So everybody who registered on our Eventbrite, I've put you guys into our random name picker. There you guys all are. Awesome. Thank you for registering. And let's go ahead and see who wins the book. Here we go. Da -da -da -da. And the winner is... Tammy Goodbar. Tammy, if you are listening, make sure to give us a thumbs up or comment. Woohoo, I'm a winner. So, Tammy Goodbar, you are the winner of the Blackwater Creatures book. Awesome. So, let me bring let me bring Linda back in here and close that down. There we go. All right. Thanks. Um, all right, guys. So, 
that is Blackwater Night Chain. I mean, if you've never done it, it is one thing that you could definitely get out there and try and see if you like it. Uh, we do run chart, or we do have uh, boats that we book to run these charters. And you can give the 4C Riviera store a call and we'll get you booked to go out diving. So thank you again, Linda, for taking the time to teach us about these animals. It was beautiful photography and very cool subject. So uh, appreciate your time and we will see you guys later. Bye. Bye, everybody.